This is Space Time, Series 22, Episode 77. Coming up on Space Time. Planet Earth escapes another asteroid near Miss. Astronomers focus on our new interstellar visitor. And scientists have grown crops successfully in Martian soil simulant. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. It's been revealed astronomers discovered a new asteroid some seven and a half hours after it swooped some 37,399 kilometers above the Earth's surface. That's closer than some satellites. The space rock, designated as 2019 RP-1, is estimated to have been between 7.4 and 17 meters wide, traveling at a speed of 25.88 kilometers per second relative to the Earth. It's just one of some 240 new near-Earth objects which have been discovered over the past month. Near-Earth objects, or NEOs, are asteroids, comets and meteoroids on orbital paths which take them less than 1.3 astronomical units from the Sun, placing them in Earth's near neighbourhood. An astronomical unit is the average distance between the Earth and the Sun, which is about 150 million kilometres, or 8.3 light minutes. The number of NEOs considered to pose a risk to Earth now stands at 886. The new findings by the European Space Agency's Near-Earth Objects Coordination Centre are based on figures provided by the Catalina Sky Survey. These latest discoveries brings the total number of known NEOs to 20,904 asteroids and 108 comets. In fact, some 1,619 NEOs have been discovered just since the start of this year alone. Eight NEOs between 2 and 20 metres in size have flown by the Earth closer than the Moon over the past month. And this Friday, we'll see a half-kilometre-wide asteroid designated 1998 HL1 flying close enough to the Earth to be seen through a decent-sized backyard telescope. In fact, it will swoop past the Earth at about 17 times the Earth-Moon distance. Over the past month, astronomers have also added a new asteroid to the risk-to-Earth list. It's 2019 SU3, and it was placed on the top 10 risk list in late September after calculations showed that the 15-metre-wide space rock had a 1 in 400 chance of slamming into the Earth in 2084. Now, don't get me wrong, it's not that it's getting more crowded up there, it's just that we're getting better at spotting these things. You're listening to Space Time. Still to come, scientists have successfully grown crops using a simulant of Martian soil, which I guess is what these days you'd call sciencing the simulant out of this. And NASA releases its new spacesuits for the Orion capsule and Project Artemis. All that and more still to come on Space Time. <music> Astronomers have taken their best and sharpest look yet at a comet that's entered our solar system from interstellar space. The comet, which has been named 2I Borisov, the I stands for interstellar, is the first interstellar comet astronomers have ever observed. Borisov speeding through our solar system on a hyperbolic path at a blazing speed of around 177,000 kilometres an hour, much too fast to be captured by the sun's gravity. Professor David Jewett from the University of California, Los Angeles, has studied the alien invader using NASA's Hubble Space Telescope, obtaining images of the object at a distance of around 420 million kilometres, the closest so far achieved. He observed a central concentration of dust, a cometary halo, around the comet's icy nucleus, and a spectacular 160,000 kilometer long cometary tail streaming behind. Jewett says it's very different from Amalmau, the only other known interstellar object to have visited our solar system. Amalmau was observed back in 2017 by the University of Hawaii, just as it was racing out of the solar system, having already swept around the sun and undertaken its closest approach to Earth before being discovered. Jewett says a Malmau looked very much just like a bare rock, but Borisov is really active, just like a normal comet. Jewett and colleagues have found so much dust on Borisov, they're having difficulty working out just how to dig out the nucleus from the data. That work will involve sophisticated image processing to separate the light scattered from the nucleus from the light scattered by the dust and ice particles. Although Borisov and Amalmau are the first two objects to have been confirmed as having entered our solar system from interstellar space, astronomers are pretty sure that there are thousands of other such travellers out there, too far away, too faint or simply too small to have been detected. 
Prior to the discovery of Borisov, every comet that astronomers have observed originated from only one of two places. They either came from the Kuiper Belt, a ring of icy debris, frozen worlds and comets that circled the Sun beyond the orbit of Neptune, or they came from the Oort Cloud, a hypothetical region surrounding the solar system and extending up to a light year into interstellar space, which contains hundreds of billions of ancient bodies that have been caught up in the Sun's gravitational field and now follow the solar system as it travels around the galaxy. Borisov was initially detected on August the 30th by Grunati Borisov at the Crimean Astrophysical Observatory when it was around 480 million kilometres from the Sun. Now, because this comet was forged in a distant solar system, it provides valuable clues about the chemical composition and structure of the system where it originated. Last week on this show, we reported that astronomers believe Borisov may have come from a nearby binary star system called Kruger 60. Kruger 60 is located some 13.15 light years away in the constellation Cephas. It's composed of two spectral type M red dwarf stars, which orbit each other every 44.6 Earth years. The primary star, Kruger 60a, is about 27% the mass of the Sun, while the secondary star, Kruger 60b, is somewhat smaller, with about 18% of the Sun's mass. Borisov entered the solar system from the direction of Cassiopeia, near the border with Perseus. Now, as seen from Earth, Borisov is currently in the northern sky and will remain there until mid-November. It will then cross the ecliptic plane on November the 13th, entering the southern sky. The ecliptic being the plane around the Sun upon which the Earth and other planets orbit. Borisov's extremely hyperbolic orbit will reach perihelion, its closest approach to the Sun, on December the 8th, but it will still only be near the main asteroid belt. It will then make its closest approach to Earth in late December, passing around 300 million kilometres from the Earth, about twice the distance to the Sun, so you probably won't be able to see it unless you've got some pretty good equipment. Future Hubble observations of Borisov are planned right through until January 2020, and of course, as you'd expect, there are a lot more being proposed. Borisov will leave our solar system heading in the direction of Telescopium, passing the orbit of Jupiter around mid-2022. You're listening to Space Time. Coming up later, we have the Science Report, wrapping up all the other news of the week, including how the mass media have gotten absolutely wacko over a piece of yellow slime mould. A new study has found that more crust was formed on the early Earth than previously thought. The findings, reported in the journal Nature Geoscience, has major implications for the rate of crustal growth in Earth's earliest times and for the evolution of global tectonics. The research is part of Monash University's Pulse of the Earth project, which aims to establish the origin and evolution of the continental crust and its role in the long-term development of the Earth system. The continental crust's evolution controls the planet's environment. It also contains vital resources upon which society depends. The study's lead author, Dr Alex McCoy-West from Monash University, says constraining the growth and destruction of the continental crust in Earth's earliest history is complicated by the severe bias in the rocks preserved at Earth's surface. McCoy-West and colleagues found that up to four times the present amount of proto-crust was formed during the first billion years of Earth's history. The research suggests that both the rate of crustal growth and recycling on the early Earth have been significantly underestimated. The authors focused on using a wide range of geochemical tools to better understand the processes involved in the formation, differentiation and evolution of the planet and its major geochemical reservoirs. McCoy West, a high-temperature isotope geochemist, has studied core formation and the evolution of the Earth's mantle. He's researched the processes involved in the stabilisation of young continental crust, such as the sunken continent of Zealandia. This new research used advanced mass spectrometer techniques to constrain the composition of the mantle, finding it to have been constant for the last 3.5 billion years of Earth's history. This mantle composition was then used to calculate the volume of crust on the early Earth. McCoy West says traditional crustal growth models can't account for a scenario in which there's more continental crust than what's preserved today. However, the author's unique modelling approach wasn't pinned to the present-day crustal record and therefore provided a new perspective on the amount of crust in Earth's earliest history. McCoy West says the study is significant because until this period of extensive crustal growth and recycling had finished, the stable continental crust required for the evolution of life would not have existed. The Earth hasn't changed size, it's the volume of crust. And it's also not at one time, it's a time integrated. So over the first billion years of its history, we've shown that there's a lot more crust than previously thought. So all crustal growth models in the present day are based on mostly the 
preserved crustal record. And there's a severe bias in this record because there are basically no rocks that are preserved that are older than 4 billion years old. So if you use this record, you get gradual crustal growth, whereas alternative approaches suggest very rapid crustal growth. So the volume of crust on the early Earth was, you know, we had a large amount of crust, the same as today, but it's all disappeared now. What we did instead was look at the mantle and showed that it has had a constant composition since 3.5 billion years ago. And then we used that to make inferences about crustal growth, how crustal growth occurred in the earlier. But we've just constrained the amount of material that needed to come out of the mantle. But some of that has subsequently been recycled. So it's just we needed a lot of crust in the earlier. And so the Earth was very different in the earlier than it is today. Today we have subduction zones. And in the earlier, there was more of a stagnant lid world. So you had after the first magma ocean, soon after the moon forming impact, a crust would have formed. And at some point when this became unstable, it would have overturned and so you could have had multiple episodes of this mantle overturned in the earlier. So the crust is basically the lightest, for want of a better term, of the chemical elements which make up the earth. They're the ones that are floating on the surface, so to speak, and they're the ones which have solidified to form the crust. Yeah, so the interesting part of what we did compared to what most studies can do is we know that the composition of the crust on the early earth was different. So the earth was hotter, so the magmas were more basaltic or they had a different chemical composition, whereas today the continental crust is mostly granite. And so when you take that into account in the modelling as well, you get much higher numbers, up to four times the present volume of continental crust in the first billion years of Earth's history. Like, so I'm over in Western Australia now, and there's some ancient cratonic nuclei, so the Pilbara and the Yilgarn cratons, but they're 3.5 and 2.7 billion years old or something. So beyond four, we've got a few little mineral grains, but nothing else is preserved. But there clearly was a crust on the early Earth. You can't just have a giant magma ocean very quickly after the moon forming impact. The Earth has to solidified in some way, even if there was a magma ocean, it's going to get a crust on it. And no one's really put any constraints on how much this crustal volume could have been or what it would have been like. So basically, if you do the calculations, you would require a 20 kilometer thick crust around the entire Earth. So it's not actually that ridiculous. The examples of the earliest crust we find today are in South Africa, in Hudson Bay, in Canada these yeah. days. Yeah. Yeah. So up in around Hudson Bay and also in Greenland, those are the two oldest cratonic nuclei. So the stuff in South Africa is about 3.6, 3.7, I think. So right. in Greenland, there's 3.8, 3.9. And in the Acasta in Canada, there's one rock that's 4 billion years old. And then the oldest minerals are the Jack Hill zircons, which are in Western Australia. But yeah, so we have no preserved record to understand what's going on in the earlier. So we took an alternative approach, which is looking at the composition of the mantle. So the Earth is divided into three main layers, the crust, the mantle, and the core. And the largest silicate reservoir on Earth is the mantle. So it preserves the like it integrates a much larger amount of the volume of the Earth and it's also we can see if its composition has changed or not through time by looking at magmas of different ages. And what did you find? As the, and you found the composition hasn't changed? Yeah, so we used high precision molybdenum isotope measurements and showed that the mantle through a type of high temperature melts from the mantle and so these magmas preserve because they're so high temperature and they're very large degree melts, they perfectly preserve the composition of the mantle at that time because there's no isotopic fractionation between the melt and the mantle melting region. And they showed that in the Archean from 3.5 to 2.7 billion years and all the way through to the present day, we have constant molybdenum isotope composition. We can infer that mantle depletion has been constant with respect to molybdenum isotopes since that time. And then we can calculate through mass balance the volume of crust that is required. I guess the interesting thing is that molybdenum is a refractory element. So it has inherits the composition from the solar nebula. We can define that from chondrite, right. chondritic meteorite, and we then use that as a baseline for understanding what has happened on Earth. And so after core formation, there could have been a fractionation, but experimental work has shown that there is no fractionation. And then that leaves us with the formation of the crust on Earth as the only global scale mechanism available to fractionate the molybdenum isotope compositions from this chondritic value, and they are fractionated. So on the early Earth, we had a very thick mafic crust, and that was a stagnant lid. 
kind of environment. And then at some point we've transitioned to the modern Earth where we have separate continents and oceans and subduction as we see on the present day Earth. And how the crust has changed is, I guess, there was a totally different tectonic regime in the early Earth. That's the kind of implication. And when you had this stagnant lid that then was going to go over basically a complete overturn of the Earth's crust, you would not be able to form the stable continents on which life probably evolved. And that's the kind of probably major implication of the work. There's a lot of debate about when plate tectonics actually started on Earth too, isn't there? Yeah, there is a lot of debate about that. So people suggested between about 3.5 and 2.5 billion years ago, but it, like anything, it also depends on what you define plate tectonics as. Is it a signature of subduction or is it a globally linked network of tectonic plates? And you can have localised subduction in the earlier, and but probably plate tectonics properly did not start until the end of the Archean, which was 2.5 billion years ago. But yeah, that's another one of these things where people argue about it but they're probably just defining it differently but yeah there's a, there is a lot of debate about that and I guess our work definitely supports that you need a different tectonic regime in the earlier than the present day to generate this extra volume of crust in a very rapid time. That's Dr Alex McCoy West from Monash University and this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Scientists have successfully grown crops using simulated Martian and lunar soils. The findings reported in the journal Open Agriculture represent an important first step in any long-term plans to establish self-sufficient bases on either the Moon or Mars. The authors used special soil simulants developed by NASA, which replicated the chemical composition and texture of regoliths found on the Moon and that found on the red planet Mars. One of the study's authors, Viga Vornling from Wageningen University in the Netherlands, says the team were absolutely thrilled when they saw the first tomatoes ever grown in Martian soil simulant turning red. The research supports the idea that it would not only be possible to grow food on Mars and the Moon to feed future settlers, but also to obtain viable seeds from crops grown there. Scientists cultivated 10 different crops, including garden cress, rocket, tomatoes, radishes, rye, quinoa, spinach, chives, peas and leeks. They also grew the same crops in regular earth potting mix as a control. Nine of the ten crops sown grew well with the edible parts harvested from them. One exception was spinach. Now, the total biomass production was highest for the Martian soil simulant, which did differ significantly from the lunar soil simulant. The seeds, produced by three species, radish, rye and garden cress, were tested successfully for germination. Warnerlink says it means the next step towards a sustainable closed agricultural ecosystem has finally been taken. This is Space Time. Still to come, we'll take a look at NASA's new spacesuits and a revolution in keeping satellites in orbit beyond their use-by dates. All that and more, still to come on Space Time. If you'd like to help support Space Time and get access to the weekly double episode commercial free versions of the show, then come and join our Patreon family. It only costs a few dollars a month, it helps keep the show going, and we offer heaps of rewards. There's bonus audio content and an invitation to join our special Patreon only Facebook group. We can come and chat, discuss the show, ask questions, whatever you want, with like minded listeners and members of the Space Time team. Get all the details at patreon.com slash space time with Stuart Gary. Now that's Patreon spelled P A T R E O N. Patreon.com slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. Details are also in the show notes or just click on the orange button on our website. And thank you to all our Patreon listeners because your generosity really does help to support our show. NASA's released its latest spacesuits to be worn by crews flying aboard the new Orion capsule. The new spacesuits, to be known as the Exploration Extra Vehicular Mobility Unit, or XEMU, are still based on the original Apollo-era spacesuits, modified versions of which were also used by space shuttle crews and are still used today by NASA astronauts aboard the International Space Station. But the suits have been dramatically updated with new features, materials and more advanced electronics. The new suits are now being tested on the ground and in the neutral buoyancy tank and will be tested in space in 2023 before being pressed into service on the Artemis III mission to the Moon in 2024. Like the old suits, the new suits are designed to protect against the temperature range of between minus 156 degrees Celsius right up to a boiling 121 degrees Celsius. Getting in and out of the new suits will be easier with entry and egress by way of a rear hatch on the back. That hatch forms part of the backpack or pless, the portable life support system. 
The Plus houses the suit's power and breathable air and removes exhaled carbon dioxide and other toxic gases, as well as odours and moisture from the suit. It also helps regulate temperature and monitors the overall suit performance, emitting warnings if the resources fall low or if there's a sudden systems failure. The miniaturization of electronics and plumbing systems have made it possible to build in many duplicate systems, thereby increasing suit safety. Because the upper torso and helmet are now one piece, the new suit provides greater mobility, with more flexible joints offering a dramatically improved range of motion. Of course, that'll mean no more bunny hops on the moon. The helmet sections feature quick-swap protective visors fitted with sacrificial shields that can protect the pressurized bubble from any wear and tear, dents or scratches. Mind you, the crews will still need to wear a cooling garment, basically a net of plastic tubes filled with water that circulate around the suit, keeping astronauts at the right temperature. And they'll still be wearing the dreaded diaper garments for long-duration spacewalks, just in case they get caught short. But the good news is the old Snoopy caps will be a thing of the past, with new built-in voice-activated mics and headphones. Like the existing suits, the new suits are designed with interchangeable parts that can be configured for differently sized people. They can also be configured for different missions, ranging from spacewalks in microgravity to walking on planetary surfaces. So, the same core system could be used for the International Space Station, the Gateway Space Station in lunar orbit, or on the surface of the Moon or Mars. And the suits are also designed to be upgraded for differences in the Martian environment, including additional technology for life support functionality in a carbon dioxide-rich atmosphere and modified outer garments to keep crews warm in the Martian winter, while at the same time prevent overheating in the Martian summer. The Exploration Extravehicular Mobility Units are basically self-contained spacecraft. Crews will also be wearing a new version of the Orange Advanced Crew Escape Suits, better known as pumpkin suits because of their colour. These were used during the Space Shuttle program, providing crews with a protective short-period spacesuit that can be worn by astronauts inside the confines of the Space Shuttle cabin. It includes a launch and re-entry helmet with communications gear, parachute pack and harnesses, a built-in life raft, life preserver unit, gloves, oxygen manifold and valves, boots, survival gear including water, flares and a first aid pack. The new version will be called the Orion Crew Survival Suit, and it's still going to be designed primarily to help protect astronauts on launch day in emergency situations, as well as during the high-speed re-entry phase back to Earth. But it will also be designed for use during high-risk parts of the mission near the Moon. It's designed to provide full life support for up to six days. That's a scenario which could be required if, for example, a meteorite punches a hole in the spacecraft's hull. And unlike the old pumpkin suits, which came in just three sizes, small, medium and large, the new Orion flight suits will be custom fit for each crew member, and they've been enhanced from head to toe. There's a new helmet that's lighter, stronger, comes in more than one size, helps reduce noise, and is easier to connect to the communication system. The pressure garment outer cover layer, which is still orange, is fire resistant, and includes a restraint layer to control the shape of the suit to improve astronauts' movement and flexibility. It features new adaptable interfaces for supplying air and removing exhaled carbon dioxide. Now, the Orion suit will still need astronauts to wear a liquid cooling garment underneath, but it also has improved thermal management designed to keep astronauts cool and dry. One of the problems with the old pumpkin suits was that the gloves wore out really quickly. The new gloves will be more durable and, thankfully, they'll also be touchscreen compatible. That was another problem with the old suits. Even the boots have been improved to provide greater flexibility. And of course, as before, the suits will be equipped with all the normal survival gear, including a personal life preserver fitted with a locator beacon, a rescue knife, and a signaling kit, mirror, strobe light, flashing light, whistle, and light sticks. A new era for commercial satellite operations has begun with the launch of a new spacecraft specifically designed to extend the life of existing satellites. Now, barring any mishaps, such as collisions with space junk or meteoroids, a satellite's service life is limited by the rate at which its orbit will decay due to things such as atmospheric drag and space weather, the amount of radiation it suffers, again, due to space weather, and the amount of fuel carried for making propulsion and attitude control course corrections as needed. Now, that usually limits the lifespan of a multi-million dollar telecommunications satellite to around 15 years. But Northrop Grumman have now developed and launched a new robotic spacecraft known as a Mission Extension Vehicle, which will literally dock to existing spacecraft, then use its own onboard electric thrusters to take over the satellite's orbital maintenance and manoeuvring operations, and in the process, extend the satellite's lifespan by another five years. That's 33%. 
Now, once it's still with one satellite, it can then move on to help another aging satellite. Now, this first mission extension vehicle, known as MEV-1, was launched aboard a Russian Proton-M rocket from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in the Central Asian Republic of Kazakhstan. The 2,330-kilogram MEV-1 was deployed into a supersynchronous transfer orbit 16 hours after launch. It'll take about three and a half months to move into a geostationary orbit where it will eventually rendezvous with and attach itself to the Intelsat 901 telecommunication satellite, which was launched way back in 2001. MEV-1 follows on from the launch in 2007 of Orbital Express, a pair of prototype servicing satellites developed by DARPRA, the United States Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. And NASA is also planning to refuel and service satellites using its own robotic spacecraft under a program it's developed called Restore-L. Also flying aboard the Proton along with the MEV-1 was the 2,846kg UTELSAT 5 West B telecommunication satellite, which was also built by Northrop Grumman. It'll provide digital and television services covering France, Italy and Algeria. A Chinese Long March 4C rocket has carried Beijing's new Gofeng-10 Earth Observation Satellite into space. The three-stage Long March 4 blasted off from the Taiyuan Satellite Launch Center in northwestern China's Jiangxi province. The satellite was eventually placed into a 613-kilometer-high polar orbit. The new Gofeng-10 replaces the previous Gofeng-10 satellite, which was lost during a launch failure in 2016. The new satellite will provide sub-metre high definition resolution for land survey, urban planning and crop yield estimates. The flight was the 21st Chinese space launch attempt so far this year, 19 of which have been successful. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. It seems being a calm and mature teenager, assuming such an animal really exists, could be linked to a lower risk of developing dementia half a century later. But it seems being an active high-energy teen could have a benefit as well. The researchers used data from a study of high school students in 1960 and looked at which students developed dementia 54 years later. A report in the Journal of the American Medical Association found that those who were calm and mature had a lower risk of dementia, and the link was strongest for kids in higher socioeconomic groups. But interestingly, they also found that high-energy extroverts also had a lower dementia risk, which they say could be due to these people having busier, more physically active lifestyles. A new study by space medicine experts claims the biggest challenge nowadays in keeping astronauts healthy in space is a surprisingly familiar everyday issue, dust. A report in the Medical Journal of America claims without gravity, dust settles further into the lungs and is more difficult to expel. It's also unclear whether dust on the space station is more toxic than its earthbound equivalent. We know dust samples from the moon caught on spacesuits were a particular problem for astronauts. They were sharp and extremely fine-grained, which helped them reach deeper into the lungs. I guess it's a good reason to pack a vacuum cleaner for that next journey to the space station. Although you need to remember that in space, no one can hear you clean. Scientists have cracked a key step in nature's water-splitting recipe, which powers all plant life on Earth and may one day be harnessed to make a limitless supply of cheap, renewable fuel. Scientists from the Australian National University and the Max Planck Institute have identified an important photosynthetic process that enables plants to split water. Now, if humans could split water using cheap materials like nature does, they'd have an endless supply of cheap hydrogen fuel for transportation, without the carbon emissions that are contributing to human-caused climate change. The study, reported in the journal Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, reveals how a key enzyme involved breathes by stretching like a concertina during its reaction cycle, enabling the uptake of water to begin the splitting process. Australia Post is warning the community of widespread scam text messages telling customers there are problems delivering a package or that a parcel won't be delivered or that a parcel won't be delivered due to an unverified shipping address. The text messages use AusPost as the sender's name, which means it appears in the same text thread as other legitimate AusPost communications, and it then asks you to click on a link. Now, this link leads to a fake website with the Australia Post logo, which then asks you to verify your address and provide a payment. By entering these details, the scammer can then steal your personal and financial information. Australia Post says it never sends emails or text messages asking you to click on a link to print out a receipt or label for parcel collection or tracking or to access a package. 
nor will it ever ask you to send an email containing your personal financial information, including IDs, passwords, credit card details, or account information. The parasitological park has managed to get the world's mainstream media in a tizzy over a yellow slime mould. There's nothing new about Physarum polycephalum, the many-headed slime, other than its PR. But this latest press release about this unicellular creature makes it sound like something straight from outer space. In fact, they've even named it the Blob, after the bloodthirsty alien monster that attacked a small town in rural Pennsylvania in the classic 1958 science fiction horror film. Luckily, this Blob isn't dangerous to humans, preferring instead a diet of leaves and logs. Still, none of that detracts from the fact that these really are fascinating creatures that have mystified scientists. For example, firstly, they're not plants. They look like a type of fungus, but they act more like an animal, although they're not an animal. And they have some amazing properties, not the least of which is the fact they come in 720 different sexes. Try working that one out during a heavy night clubbing. They can move around without legs or even a central nervous system. They can heal themselves in two minutes if cut in half. They can detect and digest food despite not having eyes, a mouth or even a stomach. And though they don't have a brain, they're still able to learn, finding the quickest way out of a maze and being able to pass that knowledge onto other slime molds they come into contact with. Scientists have placed them in the protist family, which is pretty well any eukaryotic organism that's not a plant, animal or fungus, and simply grouped together for convenience. A new study has found that the sort of people who tend to believe in conspiracy theories usually also tend to believe in pseudoscience and paranormal phenomena. The findings reported in the journal Applied Cognitive Psychology show that some people appear to have a general susceptibility to believing in unsubstantiated claims. Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics says they also tend to have a propensity to move on to the next pseudoscience thing as soon as one of their beliefs get debunked. Yeah, this is uh, probably not that surprising to most skeptics. I mean, they've always thought that uh, people who believe in paranormal things have very wide-ranging beliefs. It might be that there's an issue there of rationality, that they take all things the same way. They will tend to believe all things without a lot of critical thinking. So if you believe one, you'll tend to believe the rest. It's also handy that if one of them drops out, if one theory is totally debunk they can move on to the next one without any great angst. The interesting thing was that the result recently was put forward a paper published in Applied Cognitive Psychology in America where uh, they looked at various students. Now the, the trouble with this is actually with the worrying thing is this was the author's own psychology undergraduate students and he found that a lot of them believed in a whole range of conspiracy theories and in the paranormal and basically what they did was they put about 30 specific conspiracy theories to the psychology students and asked them do you believe in these or not? The trouble is half of them were made up. And so what worries me is having these people going out into the industry as psychologists who will believe in conspiracy theories and uh, the paranormal. So it makes you wonder about their ability to offer rational advice to their patients. Not all of them are that bright. That's what we found out, actually, that, that any sort of qualification is no defence or um, immunity to belief in some very, very strange things. You can always find a PhD somewhere to substantiate your crazy belief. A fellow who we actually discussed in an article in our magazine who was a firm believer in the hollow earth. In fact, he spent two hours trying to see the hollow earth and he was really critical of flat earthers. Oh, really? He said, he doesn't know. I don't know how the flat earthers can endorse the... Yeah, the evidence is obviously not there for a flat earth. It's saying it's all there for a hole it's in the pole. It's there for a hole in the pole. I remember back in the old days, we used to deal a lot with creationists, and the creationists hated the astrologers, so, and the astrologers hated creationists. So we just sort of, if we're having an argument, we just sort of put them together and walk away and watch them explode. Oh, that's just cruel. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it was fun. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. And that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audioboom, from SpaceTimeWithStewardGary.com, or from your favourite podcast download provider. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web that I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary, and you can also find us on the Spacetime with Stuart Gary YouTube channel. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 